Hi, everyone, and welcome to the second edition of the Summer Speaker Series, brought to you by AEI's Academic Programs Department. The Summer Speaker Series is a chance for members of our student network to stay connected with each other and to take a deeper dive into some of the latest scholarship coming out of AEI during the summer months. My name is Derek Wajo, and I'm with the Academic Programs team here at AEI as their intern. And today, I'm really excited to be speaking with Brent Arell and Adam Smith for our times. Before we get started, I want to remind you all that we'll be hosting these conversations on Wednesdays, usually at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time, throughout June and July. So please keep an eye on your inbox for future invitations and be sure to like and follow us on Facebook and Instagram at AEI for Students to check out our full June lineup. In addition, if you attend three or more of our summer speaker series, you'll be automatically entered into a t-shirt giveaway. We're doing our best to usher in those summer vibes, even under quarantine. The design for the shirt should be posted on Instagram soon, and, but please stay tuned throughout the summer for your chance to win. So our format for this evening is pretty straightforward. Brent and I will have a conversation for around 20 minutes or so, and then I'll turn to your questions as the audience. If you have questions for Brent throughout, please make sure to type in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try and get to as many as we can in the last 10 minutes of our session. With all that said, I'm very excited to introduce our guest here. Brent Orell is a resident fellow here at AEI, where he focuses on career and technical education, criminal justice reform, prison, uh, prison education and reentry, and the US workforce as a member of AEI's Poverty Studies Division. If you were to search for Adam Smith on AEI's website, you would likely find Brent's name in close association. Brent has written extensively on Smith's moral and economic philosophy and how it remains relevant for contemporary pu public policy debates. Without further ado, Brent, thank you so much for joining us. It's an absolute pleasure to be with you. I, I only regret uh, that I can't be in person with everyone. I have so enjoyed my interactions with uh, academic programs and all the students. It's really been a highlight of my time at AEI. Well, we've really enjoyed having you um, join the team at various events as well. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, just to, to kick things off here, you know, I think the audience is probably pretty diverse in their background knowledge of Smith. So do you think you could give a slight intro into his life and his works? Sure. Um, okay, so Adam Smith uh, is, uh, was an 18th century, 1700s, 18th century um, Scottish, not English, Scottish philosopher uh, who, um, who took part in something that is more broadly known as the Scottish Enlightenment. Um, uh, we, we tend to think of the Enlightenment as being kind of a monolith, but it was very different uh, depending on uh, the, the, the country that it was taking place in. So the French Enlightenment was different than the Scottish Enlightenment, the English Enlightenment. Uh, and um, the Scottish Enlightenment was especially influential and productive um, in terms of shaping the development of the institutions that um, guide our lives even up into today. Uh, and and um, Smith was one of the leading lights of, of the Scottish Enlightenment. Um, he's best known, of course, for the, um, his, his great um, extensive treatise on economics, the wealth of nations. Um, he's less known for what is perhaps in my view, and I think that I think many scholars agree with this, um, uh, is less well known, but more important book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments. Um, and uh, we'll get into, you know, um, some of uh, the, the back and forth as it relates between uh, the relationship between those two books as we go on um, through this conversation. Fantastic. Yeah, so I guess looking at those two works in particular, you know, what sort of influential concepts or ideas do you think people should know about from, from you know, the theory of moral sentiments and the wealth of nations? Okay, so... Um, uh, when you say the, when you say Smith's name, um, the for for anyone who knows anything about him, the immediate um, sort of mental hook they have for Adam Smith is the Invisible Hand, um, and that refers to the way that markets um, behave to allocate resources. Um, so that's the big concept um, from uh, that that we associate with him. 
Actually, only the, the term only appears, I think, twice in all of his writing, um, but it's the thing that has stuck in people's minds, usually in, a, I think, in a, in a bit of a sinister way. But, you know, okay. who wants an invisible hand around? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> theory of Moral Sentiments is a, uh, in my view, a kind of co a complex look at the dynamics of um, social processes that, that end up making us human beings. Um, and uh, as I alluded to before, there, uh, there is something of a conflict, a perceived conflict between the theory of moral sentiments and uh, the wealth of nations. And it's referred to as the quote unquote Adam Smith problem <laughs> because he comes across so differently in the two books mm. and uh, they can't possibly be written by the same guy. And I think that's a complete misunderstanding of, um, of, of the relationship between these two books. They are, um, they are more like nesting dolls. Mm. Uh, you have on the outside of the nesting doll, you have, the wealth of nations and free markets and the invisible hand theory of moral sentiments sits inside that and animates that. Um, and, and within the theory of moral sentiments, you have um, a description of how human beings become human. That is remarkably subtle and nuanced and prophetic. Um, I think, uh, and, and I find it as somebody who's interested in social policy, um, just as interesting, just as important, and maybe more important than the insights derived in the wealth of nations. Mm. Yeah. So I mean, thinking about Smith then as a like philosopher of human nature or human emotion, even uh, you know, there's this concept of sympathy that seems to come mm -hmm. up quite often in discussions around him maybe even as a basis for some of his moral philosophy. Do yeah. you think you could unpack for us what people mean when they refer to Smith and his idea of sympathy? And the idea of sympathy. Okay, so sympathy isn't, uh, in Smith's um, understanding, is not about fellow feeling uh, in the sense of pity. Mm. Uh, we tend to think of sympathy as being about uh, our feeling, our warm feelings and uh, towards uh, the dis, uh, disadvantaged person, somebody who's struggling. Um, and that's what we mean by sympathy. That's not what Smith meant by sympathy. Um, what he meant by sympathy was our intrinsic desire to know, I think, uh, this is the way I would put it, to know others and to be known by others. Um, and um, this is something that's deeply embedded in our nature. Um, we, uh, the, 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 the single most beautiful line, I think, uh, in, uh, in the theory of moral sentiments is that we, we desire not just to be loved, but to be lovely. Um, we, we all, um, uh, we all have a, a need to be loved, but we also have a need to believe within ourselves that we deserve to be loved, um, that we, uh, are uh, conforming to uh, the um, the good uh, the good esteem of the people that we care about around us, um, and so that means that from the time that we're children, um, we are brought into you know we're brought into the world. Um, we're basically kind of a blank slate, uh, and that we learn. Um, about love and about being lovely, that is worthy of love, through our interactions with others. Um, the way I think about it is that Smith actually doesn't have one invisible hand. He has two invisible hands. He has uh, the invisible hand working in and through the market and the invisible hand that guides us in our social relationships. Um, and and we gradually come to understand who we are in relation 
to other people. Um, and uh, those mechanisms are what build us up and make us suited to um, the rest of society. Uh, uh, it, it is, um, uh, you know, some people look at it and say, well, uh, aren't these rules binding on us, whether we agree to, to them or not? Sure. Um, and um, the answer is yes, but they're binding to us in more than one way. Hmm. You can take them as received. Uh, God gave them to us. And Smith refers to God in his books um, and, and the role that, the, that divine providence plays. But he's also looking at how um, that, that principle gets uh, expressed in our sociology in the way that we relate to one another. So um, the, the rules are true um, be, in, his, in Smith's view. The rules are true because they work. Um, and they've been demonstrated to work over millennia. Hmm. So, I mean, it almost sounds like there is this form of external obligation, right? So laws, culture, society, and then in a certain way, sympathy functions as an internal source of obligation to mm -hmm. our neighbor or our fellow mm -hmm. man. Is that a correct understanding, do you think? Yeah, I think, I think that's right. I, uh, I, again, uh, we, des we desire to be loved and to be lovely. Um, and the people around us help us to understand what loveliness actually is. Um, uh, we, um, we are engaged in a dialogue from the time that we're born um, uh, with others, uh, not always in words. Often, you know, anybody who thinks about their own parents yeah. knows sure. uh, that it doesn't always require a word sure. to know when we are doing well or poorly. Um, and um, that the, those exchanges build up over time our capacity for understanding um, what is good and what is true. I guess a follow-up question here would be, you know, Smith isn't, what, would you cla classify Smith as a communitarian then, or, or how would you understand maybe his, um, his view of political interaction and ordering, right? Yeah, it, it, Smith is, tr is, for me, this has been one of the harder parts of uh, accepting some of what, um, uh, what Smith said about politics in his own era. Mm -hmm. uh, he um, was actually quite um, embracing of the idea of aristocracy, mm -hmm. that, um, that we shouldn't ask too many questions about why some people have advantages that other people don't have yeah, yeah. bridle against that, uh, that um, those uh, inequities and inequalities uh, tend to develop for reasons that we can't see. They, they build up over time. And if you, if you attempt to tear them down and replace them, you have to be, that's a very tricky proposition Smith's mm -hmm. view, I think, um, and it opens uh, opens things up to a whole range of other problems that we can't see. Uh, now, for me, as somebody who came up in a really just kind of a middle class, lower middle class family, mm -hmm. uh, I want everything to be a meritocracy. Sure. I want uh, I want people to rise based on their ability, not on what they inherit. So that's one of the what I think one of, for me, has been one of the trickier things about reading Smith is that it cuts against my, uh, some of the populism that I ha have inherited, but I can see the argument that he's making, uh, sure. that those institutions uh, that embody um, inherited power, inherited wealth, and so on, mm -hmm. have served a purpose uh, in, in preserving society. Mm -hmm. And uh, we shouldn't just throw them out uh, willy-nilly. Mm. So I guess in thinking about inequities, one of the things you mentioned in your article is the difference between consumption poverty versus non-material poverty. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could explain maybe what the difference is or the nuanced differences there and then why sure. this is so important for you. Yeah. So um, poverty in America um, and globally, at least up until you know, recent events, uh, the last um, two centuries have been an absolute miracle for all of humanity. Mm -hmm. 
we've seen um, consumption poverty, which is defined as uh, uh, if, if you're poor from a consumption standpoint, that means you cannot afford the basic necessities of life. Mm-hmm. And uh, just as a, for instance, in the United States, um, prior, uh, in 1960, about um, one in three Americans um, was below the com- consumption poverty line. That is a lot of people. And if you, if you lay that against our current population, that would be like 110 million Americans would, uh, would, not, have, would not be able to afford um, food, housing, um, uh, and other essentials um, for life. Mm-hmm. Since 1960, consumption poverty in the United States has fallen to about 3%. It's been a 90% reduction in consumption poverty. And that's been driven um, by a number of things. One, the most important is economic growth. Um, We are a vastly richer society than we were in 1960. It's almost unimaginable, the difference um, between uh, 1960 and 2020. Mm-hmm. Um, we've also done uh, a lot as because of that wealth. We've been able to do a lot as a society to ensure a safety net mm-hmm. that um, protects people from falling falling into this kind of absolute poverty. I'm sorry, the sun is getting in my face. Um, <clears throat> so. Uh, Um, so, uh, we have things like Medicaid, Medicare, we have social security, we have food stamps. Um, we have a variety of programs that we're able to fund because we are such a wealthy society that transfer income to people who need it in order to prevent them from falling into destitution. Uh, and so that's, we've done a good job at, uh, really almost eliminating that kind of deep and pervasive poverty in the United States. Doesn't mean that poverty's gone. Sure. Uh, but, but it's been ameliorated to a really, you know, fantastic, un, uh, unbelievable degree um, when you look at it in the context of global conditions and history and so on. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, but poverty does persist mm-hmm. and persists um, in my view, in terms of um, kind of a social poverty, um, uh, which we see manifested in things like uh, abuse of drugs and alcohol, okay. of un- you know um, of long term unemployment, mm-hmm. of dependency, of um, of uh, unmarried births. Which have reached such a, a, a you know unbelievably high level uh, over the over the last few decades. Um, that kind of poverty is not susceptible to uh, just spending more money. Sure. Right. Uh, it, and it emerges, in my view, from a breakdown in that socialization process that. Um, Smith refers to in the theory of moral sentiments. It's possible for that, that, that kind of serve and return that happens between parents and children Mm -hmm. become corrupted uh, for people to, you know, uh, to not have the models that they need um, in order to thrive, Mm -hmm. learn how to thrive. Mm -hmm. And so that's the poverty that I think um, is our great challenge moving forward. It's no longer the economic poverty that has afflicted humanity for uh, forever. Uh, it's only recently been relieved, but this kind of social um, poverty uh, that really threatens to pull people back into a different kind of destitution. You know, I, I guess my last question here, uh, to sort of make things um, practical or to bring the concept of sympathy, um, sort of make it real for the audience here. Um, you know, how can our audience made up of current undergraduate students and alumni 
apply Smith's insights on sympathy in our daily lives, whether that's in addressing poverty or inequities, um, whether it's non-material or material poverty. You know, and yeah. I guess the follow-up question to that would be, you know, is sympathy dead in an era of poverty? <laughs> no, you can't kill sympathy. Uh, it is, um, it's intrinsic to our nature. Um, it can be distorted. It can be neglected. It can be disrupted, but it can't be destroyed. Um, and so uh, when you sit down, when, when students sit down in the dining hall to have dinner together, they're engaging in sympathy. Uh, they are reacting and responding to one another in this dynamic of uh, wanting to be loved and lovely. Sure. Uh, and, uh, and so it's, it's around us and it's operating um, all the time. And, um, and so I, I think that, um, so from a, a personal standpoint in terms of how we apply this, I think one of the most important things is to just be aware uh, that it's happening. I mean, it's like asking a fish what it feels like to be wet. <laughs> uh, and uh, we need to encourage people to recognize um, how, um, incredibly delicate and important relationships are um, and, uh, and encourage people to um, respect and, and enter into the sympathetic process uh, intentionally. Uh, it's where you're going to have the biggest impact in your life is in these relationships, uh, not, in, not necessarily in your work, uh, in your career, um, but it's going to be in your marriage. It's going to be in your family. It's going to be in your community in the way that you um, uh, understand that in everything that you say and do, you are influencing, whether, whether you know it or not, you are influencing the development and happiness of others. That's wonderful. Um, so I guess, you know, moving to the Q&A portion um, of our time, I want to start off with a question by uh, John Sabella. And again, as a reminder to the audience, um, please feel free to go ahead and use the Q&A function at the bottom of um, the Zoom screen and type in your questions and they can be answered live. But to, to kick things off, so John writes, uh, based on Adam Smith's writings, what would he have to say about the social and economic events like the government response to COVID-19 and then perhaps if you want to touch on this one, various protest movements the past month, a uh, few months. Great question. Um, <clears throat> I think that one of uh, Smith's insights that he develops in the theory of moral sentiments is directly applicable to what we've seen on the COVID crisis um, is uh, that life is really unpredictable. Um, uh, and can't be managed and controlled centrally, mm. um, and we've and that's that's really kind of the basis of the whole federal system that we that we that we operate within mm -hmm. that idea that um, that we need to decentralize our responses in order to have them be relevant to local communities, and the way that that's manifested, I think, in the COVID crisis is how governors and mayors have moved to the forefront in managing this crisis and the federal government yeah. has kind of stepped back. Um, uh, there have been some problems, um, some, some significant failures at the federal level. Mm -hmm. You know, the failures of the, of the Centers for Disease Control around testing mm -hmm. um, uh, and the World Health Organization in terms of monitoring and reporting on what was happening overseas mm -hmm. got here. We can see how uh, uh, Smith would refer to this as a, the problem of the man of systems. Mm -hmm. Systems believes that he can develop a system to manage and control everything around him uh, mm -hmm. when the reality is that this invisible hand function is overwhelming our capacity um, uh, on a moment-to-moment -moment basis to manage uh, really much of anything. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why we need, that's why human beings need to be free. <laughs> because it isn't because human beings are perfect or, you know, they're never going to make a mistake. It's institutions 
uh, by interfering with that mechanism, get in the way of, um, of people being able to manage direct and direct their own lives. Mm-hmm. So we have this idea of, uh, which is very Smithian, I think, of um, subsidiarity. Mm, sure. There are certain things that the federal government is supposed to do and certain things that it shouldn't get involved in. Mm-hmm. States should do certain things that they do well. Localities should do the things that they do well. Uh, and families and individuals need to do the things that they do well. And that's how you get to a healthy society. Um, so there are some things in this crisis that the federal government needs to lead. Development of a vaccine. Sure. Um, extremely important. Um, uh, um, and there are other things like, do we open or close our our state's economy or our, our city's economy? Mm-hmm. The federal government just can't judge um, uh, from where it is, and I, it's been uh, it's been remarkable to see, and quite encouraging to me to see how um, how well some of our governors have really done. Yeah. Okay. So we really have time just for a few more questions here. Um, but one that I wanted to ask you earlier that I'm thankful has come up in the Q and A is, you know, is there a public policy in particular, maybe one that you've been a part of? or that you've helped research or support that you think encompasses Smith's understanding of sympathy well? Yeah. Um, so uh, I wrote a piece that's on my scholar page, and maybe we can circulate it mm-hmm. uh, to the audience as a follow-up. But, uh, and it, it deals with a, um, uh, uh, or it covers the thinking of a man out in Oakland, California, by the name of Mauricio Miller. Okay. And he runs something called the Family Independence Initiative. Right. And uh, he w- he's in his 70s now, um, and he spent his whole life in social and human services, and trying to help um, you know, poor communities and individuals. And it's, uh, it's, he's a, a remarkable story because um, as he has gotten older, he's reached some pretty startling conclusions about what we should and shouldn't be doing. Mm-hmm. The Family Independence Initiative actually has one core policy that it pursues. Uh, it's in cities all over the country. Mm-hmm. It's got one core policy that it lives by, which is stop helping. Don't help. And, and that doesn't mean that, that you abandon people. Um, mm-hmm he means by that is that people often have far more agency and far more resources than they give themselves credit for. Mm -hmm. And rather than turning immediately to the government for assistance, uh, when they hit a crisis, what family, what the family independence initiative tries to do is to build up the capacity of individuals, families, neighborhoods, Mm -hmm. communities, to address their own problems. And I'll just give you one story, which I think really uh, exemplifies this. Uh, Someone came into um, the Family Independence Initiative and they had a serious legal problem. I'm not not entirely clear on what the problem was, but they were very, very uh, concerned and were crying out for help. You have to help me because I've got this legal problem and it's gonna be a huge deal if I don't get it dealt with. So you got to help me find a lawyer. Yeah. So the rule is no helping. And the, uh, the staff started um, talking with uh, this person and saying, well, are, are you, are you sure you don't know any lawyers? And she said, no, I, I don't, I don't know any lawyers and you really got to help me. And they said, so they went back to Mauricio and they said, well, she says she does she really needs help. She doesn't know any lawyers. And he said, well, you can't help. You've got to go back and just talk to her some more. Um, and uh, the third time they asked the question, don't you know any lawyers? She finally kind of relaxed enough to sit back and consider the question because the first two times she couldn't hear it. She was too, um, too stressed. Stress makes you stupid. Um, and it reduces your IQ, literally reduces your IQ. Um, if you're under a lot of stress. And so you have to help people unwind a bit 
before they can even begin to answer that question. So by the third time they asked, she had calmed herself down enough to consider the question, do I actually know an attorney? And she said, well, you know, the guy uh, who I, I, I clean offices and one of the guys I clean offices for is an attorney. Mm-hmm. You know, after having said, I don't know any attorneys. Uh, I said, well, go talk to him first. If he can't help you, then come back and we'll strategize some. So she went to him and he said, uh, I don't do that kind of law, whatever it was, housing or uh, child support or whatever it was. I don't do that kind of law, but I know somebody who does. And he connected uh, her to that person. And, she, and he, this other attorney was able to help fix the problem, right? And so that was wonderful, right? I mean, that's how we all solve problems when the You and I or people watching us, listening to this conversation, have a problem. Mm -hmm. Our first instinct is not to say, gee, I wonder which government agency could help me out with this. (laughs) We we think about our friends and our neighbors and the people we go to church with. Um, You know, these informal networks uh, are the the invisible hand in action. Um, And um, so... So that was great. She got her problem solved that way. But even better, she became in her neighborhood like the legal resource person. And other people in the community would say, you know, you got your problem fixed. Tell me how you did that. I've got a problem. And so she was the one who became the connector. That's how social networks are re-knit. It isn't something that we come in from the outside to do. Well, I think that's a great note to end on. Uh, Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today's conversation. Uh, Brent, thank you so much for joining us. You're so welcome. I see a bunch of other questions in the queue. If you want to collect those and send them to me, I'll be happy to respond uh, individually by writing. That'd be, that'd be phenomenal. And again, I guess to, to our wonderful audience, thank you all for tuning in today. We hope you can join us again next Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern time. We'll be speaking with AEI's Corey Shockey on America's role in the world. So definitely keep an eye out uh, for that invitation. And again, you can check out our full June lineup on Facebook or Instagram if you look at AEI for students. As my final note for the webinar, if you have any undergraduate friends who are interested in these types of conversations, please invite them to sign up for our student network, which you can find if you Google AEI Connector. To receive invitations to the Summer Speaker Series and learn more about the different opportunities that AEI has for students. Thank you all again for joining and we'll see you next week.